Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our service on this Friday of Holy Week. It always seems strange to refer to it as a Good Friday, but we do know how the story ends, so maybe that's not quite a bad thing after all. Hopefully you've all received a daffodil on your way in, and we'll be using these throughout the service as an opportunity to pray. You'll notice your daffodil is closed. Hopefully, when you return on Sunday, you will see the life burst forth into your daffodil at the foot of the cross, the same way we know life bursts forth through the grave on Easter Sunday. Our service today, there will be plenty of time for silent reflection. There will be a reading followed by a prayer and space for you to add in your own prayers or just to reflect on the words that have been spoken. So we began our journey through Holy Week with the words of the women in Jerusalem. We've arrived at the cross. We remember the words of Miriam, Anna, Sarah, Susanna, and Joanna. They tell us this of a Jesus. Kingly and gentle, powerful and caring, all rolled into one. Just like I imagined steadfast love would look. Love God, love your neighbor. It's the answer to everything. And looking at him, I knew he lived it with all his heart and soul and mind and strength. And then he looked at me and said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Suddenly I felt an overwhelming need to lean against the wall for strength. Could it be? Could it be that the God who sees had heard my cry after all? I found myself looking into his eyes. As I did, I knew that I was deeply and utterly loved just as I am. Jesus was like that, I'd found over the years. He'd let you grow into the truth that he brought in your own time. There was no judgment, no condemnation if you didn't understand. Just when you were ready was fine with him. We sat there together, we women, grieving for the disaster, wherever it was, it was coming. That's the problem with extravagant love. It brings with it extravagant heartbreak. Would you join me in our collect for today? Eternal God, in the cross of Jesus, we see the cost of our sin and the depth of your love. In humble hope and fear, may we place at his feet all that we have and all that we are. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. 
they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. He said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little further, he drew himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Lord, you entered the garden of fear and faced death. Be with those who share that agony. You shared our fear and knew the weaknesses of our humanity. Give strength and hope to the hopeless and despairing. Amen. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. Lord, you were betrayed by the kiss of a friend. Be with those who are betrayed and falsely accused. You knew the experience of having your love thrown back in your face for mere silver. Be with those whose relationships are torn apart by mistrust or temptation.
Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another. The high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is this that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of the power and come in with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, why do we still need witnesses? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Lord Jesus, you were the victim of religious intolerance. Be with those persecuted by authority and guide all who have power over others. You face the condemnation of fearful hearts. Help us not to hurt what we do not understand. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Lord Jesus, as Peter betrayed you, you experienced the double agony of love rejected and friendship denied. Be with those who are friendless and rejected by society. You understood the fear within Peter. Help us who fear the future.
Pilate asked them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. They clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews. They struck him. Lord Jesus, you were condemned to death for political purposes. Be with those who are imprisoned unfairly by powerful people. You were the victim of injustice. Change the hearts and minds of all who oppress and exploit others. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Lord Jesus, you carried the cross through the streets of Jerusalem. Be with those who are loaded with burdens beyond their strength. You needed the help of a passing stranger. Give us the willingness to help others at this difficult time and the humility to receive help in return.
a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when they will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Jesus, the women of Jerusalem wept for you. Move us to tears at the brokenness of your world. Bless Jerusalem and all places of conflict and violence and pandemic. Please bring your healing and peace to this hurting world. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Lord Jesus, you bled in pain as the nails were driven into your flesh. We weep at humanity's cruelty and pray for all who suffer, especially at the hands of others.
one of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then Jesus said, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Lord Jesus, even in your deepest agony, you listened to the crucified thief. Hear us as we unburden to you our deepest fears. You spoke words of love in your hour of death. Help us to speak words of life and hope to a world in crisis. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Jesus, who had friends and family at the cross, be with those suffering in isolation who long for companionship. You cared for your loved ones, even in your death throes. Give us a love for one another that is stronger even than the fear of death.
at three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. Lord Jesus, you died on the cross. Be with all those coming to the end of their lives. In death, you entered into the darkest place of all. There is nowhere we cannot go that your light does not shine. To you, Jesus, your lifeless body hanging on the tree of shame, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. And Joseph bought a linen cloth and taken down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Lord Jesus, Lord of life, you became as nothing for us. Be with those who feel as nothing in the world's eyes. You were hidden in a cold, dark tomb. Be with all who suffer and die in secret, hidden from the eyes of the world. As Mark plays our next piece of music, when you're ready, I'd like to invite you to bring your daffodils to place at the foot of the cross.
My name is Salome. I know what you're thinking, not that Salome. I grew up in Nazareth with Mary. We were inseparable until the angel came. Not that I knew at the time that an angel had come. One day, we were young women facing the future together. The next, Mary just stopped talking to me. Then the gossip started. She was pregnant and it wasn't Joseph's. No one knew why Joseph stood by her. She brought shame right into his house, but he still protected her. It made no sense to anyone. They were the talk of the village. They went away for the census and I didn't see her for years. Then one day, years later, she and Joseph returned with their little boy, Jesus. They'd been in Egypt, apparently. Years went by, the gossip subsided, and we became close again. I remember so clearly when Jesus started to travel and teach. Mary was mortified. After being in the spotlight all those years, she'd imagined a quiet old age, her family around her. It took her a while, but eventually she understood. And she'd reminisce about the strange event that happened at his birth. She'd always known, she said, that he wouldn't be just anybody. She just hadn't wanted to accept it. At first, I kept up with what he was doing for Mary's sake. But before long, I followed him for my own sake. His teaching made sense of the world. It made sense of me. So I was there on that awful day. We were there. People often forget it, but we were there. Later, they'd said that all his followers had run away, that he'd been left alone, quite alone, that everyone had left him. Everyone, I would ask. Yes, we all left him, Peter would say. We're all as bad as each other. We all left him. All fled. All of us? Yes, all of us, every last... Oh. It often took him a while, but most of the time he'd get there in the end, at least until he'd forgotten again. Not everyone. Exactly, I would say, not everyone. You see, we were there. Mary Magdalene and me, obviously not in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus had gone ahead with the twelve by himself leaving us bemused and grieving on the roof. But the moment we heard what happened and it went round Jerusalem like wildfire, we followed him, just like we had in happier times in Galilee. It's what I've always done. When disaster strikes and I don't know what to do, I do know what to do normally, day in, day out, until the moment comes when I don't know what to do again. So when we heard when it felt as though the world was collapsing around us, we did what we'd been doing for the past few years. We followed him. We followed him to Caiaphas' house and shivered through the long, dark hours in the courtyard. We followed him to Pilate's house, listening with incredulous horror while the crowd cried out, crucify, crucify, all around us. We followed him to Herod's house and back again. And then we followed him where we never imagined we'd go. To his crucifixion. At some point during the long, miserable wait, Mary Magdalene slipped away and came back with the other women, Susanna and Joanna, Mary, Clopas' wife, and Mary, Joseph's mother, and of course, Jesus' own mother, Mary, it was pitch back by then. So we inched closer and closer and we stood there. We stood there all that cold, wretched day, watching as breath by dying breath, our hopes and dreams died before our eyes and with them, everything we held dear.
We talked over the years, Mary and I, about the strange events that had happened when he was born. In the end, she told me about the angel coming. She'd even told me his name, Gabriel. We pondered together about it all, wondering what it all meant. The thing we talked about most was what Simeon had said to her when she'd taken Jesus to the temple as a baby. He'd said the strangest things about who Jesus would become, the outrage he would cause, and how he would reveal the people who really were. He was right. I'd seen it in so many of the people that Jesus met. I'd noticed it in myself. There was something about him, about him and how he made you react, which simply revealed who you really were, even if you weren't aware of it at all. But it was the last thing that Simeon had said to Mary that we puzzled over the most. Apparently, he turned to her at the end, looked at her with deep compassion and said that a sword would pierce her soul too. She'd wondered over the years what he'd meant. Perhaps he'd meant that awful moment when she thought Jesus was lost in Jerusalem. Perhaps he'd meant the pain of him leaving home, the desperate loss of her beloved firstborn son. Perhaps he'd meant the embarrassment she'd felt when she'd first heard that he started teaching people without ever having studied with a rabbi at first. Was that what he'd meant? We'd wondered together over many, many hours as I stood there that day and looked at Mary then. I imagined that all those things we'd talked about felt like nothing more than pinpricks right now. As we were holding on to each other in our grief in a simple effort to stay upright, I discovered that she'd been thinking exactly the same thing. I heard her whisper quietly to herself, so this is what Simeon meant. At some point during that long, lonely vigil, the beloved disciple appeared quietly by our side. I don't know when he got there. That was just like him. Never with a fanfare, never drawing attention to himself, never forcing himself into situations. I think that was what Jesus liked so much about him. His company was gentle, undemanding, easy. When so many people wanted so much from Jesus all of the time, he didn't. He was just there. He was one of those people you felt better simply because they were there. From the cross, Jesus noticed him at almost the same time we did. Jesus hadn't spoken during that long, agonizing time. But then he just said, your son and your mother, looking at one and then the other of them. Then he just looked at Mary, a look of pure love. It broke my heart and he wasn't even my son. A few moments later, he asked for a drink and sighed. It is finished. Then it was. Everything was over. Everything bar our anguish. We stood there for what felt like hours, numb and shocked. Then we did what we'd always done. We followed him. Some men we know didn't know took his body off the cross, so we followed them. They took him to a tomb nearby, so we followed them. We watched as they buried him. They didn't anoint him or use spices. They were in too much of a rush before sundown. They put his body on the ledge, rolled the stone across the entrance and went away. We stood at a distance unsure what to do next. We couldn't do anything until the next day. It was the Sabbath, but we'd agreed we'd come back early on Sunday morning before anyone else was up. We would anoint him then. You may be thinking that we hadn't thought it through and you'd be right, 
Grief does that to you. We had no idea how we'd roll the stone away. The whole task, not just the rolling of the stone, but the anointing and the ceremony, well, all of that was a man's job, really. Normally, our job was to lead the lamentation. But we had no choice. They'd run away, all of them. And there was only us. And after everything he'd been through, after everything we'd been through, we couldn't bear the thought that his body would be left there, uncared for, unwept over, unanointed. We were doing what we'd always done, following him, caring for him as best we could, even when no one noticed. They said later that everyone ran away, but we were there. People often forget it, but we were there. As our service draws to a close, know that you are welcome to join us tomorrow evening at 7.30 as we hold an Easter vigil here at Christ the King. But until then, would you allow me to pray this prayer on your behalf? Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your son Jesus Christ delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We'll play some music. Please feel free to stay as long as you'd like to in your pews, but we'll leave the building in silence. <laughs>